Today we're going to see another call. We're going to shift gears a little bit and jump right into Malachi chapter 2. But today we're going to see that God calls us all to be brave and to answer the call to serve and protect and defend the truth of God's word. All right, so I, I like uh, back all the way back in junior church, um, we used to sing a song. How many of you remember singing that song? I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. You know, we're all soldiers in the Lord's army. That's the idea right there. And he's called us all to be brave, to answer the call, to serve, protect, and defend the truth of God's word. So right off the bat, I want us all to understand this morning that God's word must be valued and it must be protected. Now, I know y'all are going to like this message this morning because it is aimed right at spiritual leadership. It's aimed right at me. I have to preach to myself this morning. So I've, I've got to ask y'all, like, how was your week? You know what my week was like? My week was like, I had to prepare a message that's aimed right at me. That's not easy to do. Actually, in all honesty, every single time I open up God's word and study God's word, I always feel like it's talking directly to me every single week. But in our passage this morning, you're going to see that, that God places a huge weight of accountability on spiritual leadership, and rightfully so. In our passage this morning, God is calling out the priests for departing out of the way, specifically for failing to defend and to teach God's word. That's, that's where they failed. That's the heart of our text. It all boils back to the fact that they failed to honor and value and serve and protect and defend God's word, which is exactly what God called them to do. So I got another question for you this morning. Does that mean that this message is not for you? Does that mean since you're like, oh, this is spiritual leadership, I can just check out. Some of you are actually going to take notes and listen even better and make sure that like you hold me to the line here this morning. No, listen, leadership is supposed to set the tone. But in many cases, leaders and people reflect each other. And I think that that is so true. So often our leadership is a reflection of its people, and it's, it's a reflection of what we tolerate. It's a reflection of what we're okay with. It's a reflection of our values. So often leadership and people, they go hand in hand. And if anything, the way that God deals with bad leadership, that's where we're going, the way that God deals with bad leadership should cause us to honor and fear him and respect him even more than we already do. So this message is for everybody. So the title of the message this morning is this, it's Embrace the Whole Truth. Okay, we're, we're in a sermon series. We're spending the whole month of Thanksgiving, to, uh, month of November talking about thanks living. Because God wants a whole lot more than just a day where we say thank you for his goodness. He wants a life that honors him in every single area and aspect of our life. And if we're going to live a life of thanks living, we've got to embrace the truth. So once I once I understood the heart of the passage and the big picture of where this was going, I just had one thing that just got stuck in my mind all week long, and it was too long to be the whole title of the message, so I just summed it up and embraced the truth. But I was thinking about the court of law, and you know what happens if, if you testify, if you have to get up on a witness stand and testify in the court of the law, the judge is going to look right at you and he's going to ask you, do you swear that the testimony that you were about to give is the the... And so y'all got that down pretty good right there. That's exactly right. So to make this message memorable, that's what's been going through my mind all week. Our job and our responsibility as believers is to embrace the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And God has called his people, all of us, to bravely serve, protect, defend, and value the truth of God's word. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. And that's what we're going to see here in Malachi chapter 2. So let's just jump right into it. The first point, if we're going to embrace the whole truth, is this. We have to take responsibility. We have to take responsibility. Look at verse 1. It says, And now, O ye priest, this commandment is for you. Now, just to bring us up to speed, we got, we got to remind ourselves of the context. And we got to remember this that God is very offended by his people right now, all right? We spent two weeks going through Malachi chapter one, and God is offended because his people are dishonoring him. They're, they're, they're failing to honor his name. They're despising his name. They're offering their sick animals and their weak animals, and they're going through the motions of worship, and yet they had the audacity to fire back at God. How have we despised your name? And so God calls him out. He, he nails him, actually. He says, you fail to honor me as father. You fail to honor me as master. And I'm a good father, and I'm a good master. And then he's like, you, you are offering me worship that costs you nothing. 
And then at the end of chapter one, he says, you've grown bored and weary with me. Just let that sink in, to, to be bored and weary with God, with the creator of heaven and earth, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who loved us enough that he gave us his son so that we could be saved and have a relationship with him. How in the world could we get bored and weary with God? And so now he's going to aim his attention and he's going to look right at the priests and he's going to look right at the spiritual leadership and he's going to say, and this is on you. You're ultimately responsible for allowing this to happen on your watch. That's why it says, and now, O ye priest, this commandment or this decree is for you. So you better listen and you better pay attention. And look what he says in verse 2. He says, if ye will not hear. And if ye will not, everybody help me out with those next four words. What's it say? Lay it to heart. To give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts. I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not, everybody help me out with those last four words, lay it to heart. Twice in this verse, he uses the phrase, lay it to heart. That phrase means, it's only used 13 times throughout the Old Testament, and that phrase means this, to determine a course of action in response to one's knowledge of something, okay? So, You decide how you're going to act based on what you know about a particular thing or about a particular truth, all right? And here's what God's saying to them. Hear this, O priest. Listen up and pay attention. If you do not give glory to my name, if you continue to fail in this aspect and in this role, and by the way, that's your whole job. Your whole job is to be amazed by who I am. Your whole job is to point people to me. And if you fail to give me glory, and if you continue to live in a way that is departed from my ways, then make no mistake about it, I will curse your blessings. By the way, this is a thousand years old promise and truth. It goes all the way back to um, the Old Testament when God made his covenant with Abraham. And he said, if you obey, I'm going to bless. And if you disobey, I'm going to curse. And then he says this, and by the way, I've already begun to curse your blessings. We're we're talking about in Malachi chapter 1. Remember, these, these people are looking at their lives, and they think that God's forgotten them. They think that God's forsaken them. They're like, they were just a shell. Their life was just a shell of what they thought it was supposed to be. And they're throwing their hands up and they're saying, God, why don't you love us? Why don't you care about us? And God says, I do love you. I do care about you. This is not on me. This is on you. And because you failed to bring honor and glory to me, because you're bored and weary with me, I'm withholding my blessings. Look at your life now. You're already going to see that I'm going to plague your life with trouble. By the way, have you ever woken up and looked at your life and it's just like, man, everywhere I look, it's just plagued with trouble. I wonder if that has anything to do with our heart's response towards God and his word and the truth of who he is. You know what's interesting about where he's at right here? God wasn't just looking for outside change. You know what, God? He didn't care if all of a sudden the best sacrifices started showing up. This is what I love about God. He needs nothing from us. It's not like he's trying to to pinpoint his people into a corner and saying, I need more money out of you, and I need your best offerings and your best sacrifices. That's not what it was about. He could have cared less if the best sacrifices started showing up. You know what God wanted? God wanted their heart. God wanted their soul. God wanted their mind. God wanted their strength. God wanted them to open up their eyes and see that they have a covenant relationship with him, with the creator of heaven and earth, and they wanted him to see that when we obey, he blesses, and when we disobey, He allows the curses and he allows the plague to start troubling our lives in all these different areas. And if we just open up our eyes and surrender and submit to God and his glory and his majesty in all of these areas, then our lives will look and be a whole lot different. And I'm not saying that your problems are going to go away and you're going to be rich. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just going to say you're going to find out that God is with you every single step of the way and is more than enough for whatever situation you find yourself in. And so God's looking for a heart change. So here's the first practical application before we move on. Make the promise. Okay, so we take responsibility. And again, the whole idea is we're taking an oath, okay? This is the whole idea. We're we're standing up and do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You know what we got to start with? We got to start with making the promise. I think it would be good if all of us this morning just closed up our Bibles put our left hand on, I can't do this, I can't put my left hand on it and hold my right hand up, I'm not magic like that. 
But in a sense, I promise to value. I promise to serve. I promise to protect. I promise to defend the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. That's where we need to start. Last week, we had our men's retreat here at the church, and I cannot get past a illustration that Ray McCormick shared with us. And he was talking about how important it is to step on first base. And he talked about when Mark McGuire hit his record-breaking single-season home run. How many of y'all remember the Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa era? Wasn't that good times, man? Like, they were chiming, like, uh, always, if you were watching TV, I remember switching over and, and watching for the record to be broken. And then all of a sudden, we found out that it was all tainted anyway, you know, because integrity and truth really does matter. But what was amazing is when Mark McGuire hit that single-season record-breaking home run, as he was going down, I can't even imagine like the euphoria, the excitement, I mean, like the crowd's going crazy. And as he was running down the baseline, you know what he did? He forgot to step on first base. And if you watch it back live, like if you go home and Google it today, you can watch it. You'll see it all happen so quickly. He forgets to step on first base. I think his coach may have even reached out and like grabbed his arm and pulled him back. But he instantly realized it. he turns around and he goes back and he steps on first base. And then he continues back on his path and everybody goes crazy. And they meet him at home plate and he sets the single season record for home runs. What's interesting about that is if he forgot to go back and touch first base, the coach from the other team could have appealed it. They would have gone back and they would have said no home run and he would have lost his record. And the point that Ray McCormick was trying to make to us as men, he's challenging us to give all diligence. And man, he was in 2 Peter chapter 1 and it's an incredible passage talking about the exceeding great and precious promises that come with our relationship with God. By the way, let that sink in. You understand that when you have a relationship with God, it comes with exceeding great and precious promises. You are adopted into God's family. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He forgets about your past. He forgives your sin. He doesn't see you in all of your brokenness. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have eternity in heaven that is waiting for you where there is fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore in the presence of Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you that empowers you and enables you to live your life and to face your challenges every single day. There are exceeding great and precious promises. And you know what he challenges them to do? Add to your faith virtue. That's where he starts. You know what virtue is? Virtue is moral excellence. Virtue is moral goodness. Virtue is waking up every day and remembering what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross and saying, if he gave his life for me, I'm going to surrender and give my life to you. I'm going to step on first base. And guess what? Just because you surrendered at a, at a teen camp or maybe you came down to an altar one day and you said, okay, God, I'm going to love your word and I'm going to give my life to you, doesn't mean that you're still doing it today. It's not just a once and done type of a thing. Every single day of our lives, every day we get up, every time we make a hit, we got to step on first base and we got to start with the fact that I promise to defend the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Have you made that promise? Do you value God's word? Are you taking responsibility? Are you taking it to heart saying that this is on me to be what God wants me to be? Secondly, this morning, not only do we take responsibility, but we understand the seriousness. We understand the seriousness. By the way, God is very serious. Look at verse 3. Look what it says. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. Now, how many of you, a little while ago, when we were reading the scriptures and we read verse 3, how many of you stopped and paused for a minute right there? I hope you did. I hope we never just like, oh, it's time to read the scriptures and we just, we read the scriptures because it's the passage that we're going to be in. And I, I want you to get, I want your minds, hopefully, to be thinking about what you're reading and to start to digest it and be like, okay, where are we going today? And I hope as you read through that and you come across a verse like verse 3 and he says, I'm going to take dung and smear it on your faces, that that kind of wakes up and catches your attention a little bit. And for those of you that don't know what dung is, I hate to say this in church, but it's poop, okay? Just so we're all on the same page. All right, that, that's what we're talking about here. Now, that's all the laughing we're going to do about this particular point because 
I want you to understand that, that God's not laughing and he's not being frivolous with this statement at all. This is a very powerful illustration. Again, I told you that going into the book of Malachi, there's a thousand years of context to this. In the Old Testament, there's a sacrificial system. And the sacrificial system was bloody and it was messy. Wherever you have animals, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have dung. You're going to have poop that goes with it. And part of the responsibility of the Levites, not just the priests, but the whole Levitical system. There was other people that served the priests. There were some of the Levites that their job was to go and clean up all of the mess and clean up all of the waste, the things that weren't pure, the things that weren't going to be offered to God, take it outside the camp and to burn it as refuge and refuse and to get rid of everything that's unclean and ungodly. And you know what God's saying here to the priests? Because you don't honor my name, because you have despised my ways, because you don't honor me as father and master, I am going to take the dung and I'm going to smear it on your face and I'm going to remove you from the camp with it because God does not want to be associated in any way with bad spiritual leadership. And to that, we should all say a loud amen. God exposes bad spiritual leadership, actually, in this chapter. There's a couple things, like, and by the way, I, I, want, I want to just say this before I jump into some of these different things. Don't just, again, sit there and think that spiritual leadership is just the pastors and the assistant pastors of our church. Spiritual leadership is anybody who stands in the position and authority of God over somebody else, at a God-given role. For instance, so we've got Sunday school teachers that are over there that are in positions of spiritual leadership, we have Awana workers. We have D group leaders here. We have fathers in here. As a father, you know that you're supposed to be a picture of Christ in your home. And if you stand in your home and you open up God's word and you say to your kids, thus saith the Lord, you're, you're standing in a position of spiritual leadership and God's not going to tolerate bad spiritual leadership. So, so how do we know? How do we judge? How do we judge where I'm at as a spiritual leader? How do you know how to identify it and to spot it so that way you can steer away from it and keep your family away from it? He's got some things in here that, that he uses to identify it. One of them was these priests failed to fear God. They did not give glory to his name. And by the way, this is where it all starts. It all starts with becoming bored and weary with God. And by the way, if we're honest, all of us have probably been there at one point or another in our lives. It starts with failing to value the truth and the worth and the beauty and the greatness of God. It starts with beginning to just be like, oh yeah, I'm saved, but what does that really mean? It's not that big of a deal. Are you kidding me? It's not that big of a deal. Our sin made us guilty and we were headed to an eternity in hell and there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. But God in his love and his mercy and his grace sent his son Jesus who died in my place and now I'm a brand new creation in Christ. That ought to motivate us every single day of our lives. Hey, the fact that we can pray. You know what prayer is? You have 24-7 access to the throne of God. You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through a mediator because Jesus Christ is our priest and he is our mediator. And you can go directly to God any time of day or night. You get to talk to the creator of the universe. How can we become bored and weary with God? How do we not tremble at the fact that I'm just a sinner that's been saved by grace? Oh, man, that's where it all starts. It starts with failing to fear God. You know what else these priests were guilty of? They departed from his ways. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. You want to know what's a pretty cool thing to be? A messenger of the Lord of hosts. That's a pretty awesome role and a pretty awesome position to be in. And you know what he's telling the priest in that verse? He's saying, you know what? Your job was to keep God's word in your mouth. You know what their job was to do? Their job was to love this book. If you're going to serve, protect, and, and defend this book, you got to know what this book says. you got to know what the word, if you're going to be a messenger of the word of the Lord is, you got to know what the word of the Lord is. And the priests should have been people that were getting up every day and, oh, I can't, I can't wait for my time that I get to spend with God. I, I can't wait for just that, that quiet time to open up God's word and to see what he has for me today, to see what his promises are, to see the things that I need to stay away from, to see the, the hope that I'm looking for and the things that I need in my life. And you know what? When you value God's word and you're getting into it like that, you know what you're going to do? You're going to talk about God's word. 
You're going to take the things that God's doing in your heart and in your life, and you're going to go share that and tell other people about what God's doing in your heart and in your life. The word of truth should be on our lips. And if you're doing that, you know what's going to happen? People are going to come to you, and they're going to say, hey, can you tell me what God's word says for this scenario or for this situation? This happened to me at work this week, and I, I need some help, and I need some truth, and you're able to go and show them from God's word. That's what should have been happening. The priest should have been in God's word, talking about God's word, and the people should have been coming, asking them for instruction in righteousness. But that wasn't happening. And look what it says in verse 8. But you departed out of the way, and he have caused many to stumble at the law. What's the best way that I can say that they departed out of the way? They lived their life in such a frivolous way that nobody believed that their faith was real or true. Sure, their, their words, they talked about God. Yeah, I'm a servant of God. I love God. I know God. I'm one of God's special people. But their actions said something loud and clear otherwise. And because of that, people who were maybe genuinely true seekers... And they were going to the spiritual leadership looking for answers and looking for hope. And they looked at their life and they said, if that's what your faith is, I want nothing to do with it. And that's how they caused many people to stumble because they departed out of their way because it wasn't real to them. And who wants a faith that isn't real? And I, I could talk about all kinds of different ways, but that, that's just summing that up. And then the last thing I want you to see. So they failed to fear God. They departed from his ways. There was no real evidence of God being real in their life. <laughs> and then look at the last one. The priests were partial in their teaching. Look at verse 9. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people. This is why God was taking that dung and smearing it on their face. According as ye have not kept my ways. Okay, you, you departed from them. And then look what he says at the very end. But have been partial in the law. Here's what this meant back in Malachi. Malachi. These priests were more afraid of the people than they were of God. And because they were more afraid of the people, they weren't stepping on anybody's toes. And you know why they weren't stepping on anybody's toes? Because their entire livelihood and existence depended upon the people. And so if they stood up and they said to their people, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing dishonors God. What you're doing is making God sick. You're bringing your weak animals. You're bringing your leftovers. You're offering worship that costs you nothing, and that means nothing. If they would have stood up and done that, they were afraid that the people would have got mad at them, and they would have stopped bringing their sacrifices, and they wouldn't have had anything to eat. So they sold out and continued to live in their pathetic existence. When the whole reason that God created them was to teach the truth and to honor his name and to trust him above everything, and what you need from spiritual leadership is people that aren't afraid to get behind a pulpit and say, thus saith the Lord. What your homes need and what your children need are dads that aren't afraid to open up this book and say, thus saith the Lord. And come what may, that's where we take our stand. And you know what, people, people sell out constantly when it comes to this because they're afraid of what other people think. And there's all kinds of other ways that we're partial in our teaching. Some people just will pick certain topics or subjects. I am very partial. Listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. But I am very partial to expository preaching, verse by verse through the scripture. Because I'll tell you what, again, I'll mention, there's probably no way on earth I would have ever picked Malachi chapter 2 as a topic to preach on, but since we're going verse by verse through the Bible, here we are at Malachi chapter 2, and we're getting the whole counsel of God. And I know it's so easy for us just to pick and choose the passages that we like and the scriptures that we like, and it's easy to forget about everything that the Bible says if we're just topically, constantly going through God's word. It's important for us not to be partial, but to teach the whole counsel of God. And so God exposes bad spiritual leadership. Now, this is why this is so important. The priests were given to Israel to teach them the law and to tell them to know God. Okay, so I brought an egg. I saw this illustration last night, and I was like, this is going to work. This is pretty awesome, okay? So I brought an egg. What's inside of this egg right here? An egg. <laughs> That's deep right there. <laughs> yes, the egg is inside the egg. <laughs> yeah, there's yolk, and there's the the white part, and there's the yolk and all that good stuff. Like, yeah, actually, you're right. The egg is inside the egg. What I want to eat is inside of this shell, okay? So the way that you could look at this is 
The priests were the shell. Spiritual leadership was the shell of protection that was supposed to protect what was inside. And what was inside? Inside was the covenant relationship with God, okay? What made Israel special and unique was not anything that was special and unique about Israel. It was God's covenant love for them. It was that God promised that I'm going to love you and be merciful and faithful to you. And it's completely dependent on me and has nothing to do with you. And all you got to do is get up every day and just determine to please me and to just love my word and to honor me. And if you mess up, ask for forgiveness of your sin. I mean, God's not expecting perfection out of his people. He's gracious and he's merciful. And their job was to defend and to protect that relationship, to go around to the people and say, hey, you know what you need to do if you want to be blessed? You got to know God's word. And you got to have a relationship with God. And by the way, look over there at that tabernacle. And you know those sacrifices? God accepts sacrifices for our sin because he loves us and he wants a relationship with us. And that's the job of spiritual leadership, to protect the specialness of the relationship and the covenant love and th that we can have and enjoy with God the Father. And you know what happens if that outer shell breaks? It just slips right out. And this is the problem with bad spiritual leadership. Because they departed out of their ways, they caused many people to stumble. Because they failed in protecting and defending and serving and valuing the truth of God's word, the value of who God is, the value of his mercy and his grace and his love and his forgiveness didn't look that valuable and it just slipped right out and slipped right past people who just stumbled and departed from their way because they're like, if that's what faith is and if that's what you're defending, there ain't nothing there to defend. There's nothing special there. Do you understand the importance of why we take that oath and we understand the seriousness of what's at stake, we, when we value and know God's word and his truth, we provide that protection so that other people know there's something special, there's something worth valuing, there's something worth having inside here. And so the practical application right here is trust the judge. Trust the judge. I want you to understand that God sees the sin. When we're trusting the judge, God sees the sin. It is true that God is a God of mind-blowing love and mercy and grace. And are you thankful for God's love, mercy, and grace? But you know what else God is? He's just. He's holy. He's righteous. The Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. You know who God always has the harshest words for in the Bible? People that know better. Malachi 2 one of the harshest language that you'll, God says, again, I will smear dung on your face. He was saying, you need to be removed from the camp. You're not worthy of standing in that position. You're dishonoring my name. That's some pretty harsh words, and it's for spiritual leadership. It's for people that knew better. You get to the New Testament, you know who God was harsh to? He was harsh to the Pharisees, and he was harsh to the Sadducees. He was harsh to religious leaders, people that should have known better. You know who he's not harsh to? Sinners who know that they need a savior. I think about the woman that they found in adultery and the very act of adultery and the spiritual leaders bring him to Jesus and they're like, she was found in the very act of adultery. What should we do? The law says that we should stone her. And you know what Jesus says? He who is without sin cast the first stone. Our God is merciful and gracious to humble and repentant sinners, but to people that know better, and to people that take advantage of his truth and take advantage of other people, oh, God will judge. And you know what that means for all of us today? That God hates. Let me say this right. God hates priestly failure. God hates pastoral failure 10,000 more times than you and I ever possibly could. And passages like this are there in the Bible to comfort us and to help us to know and to see that God sees the sin, and he hates the sin. And the second part of this is not only does he see the sin, but God sees your hurt. Passages like this exist to show us that the leader is wrong, but not God. And I want to just pause here for a second, because I know in a crowd like this, I know that unfortunately there have been many people in here who probably have sat under bad spiritual leadership, 
And I know that there are people that, that have come to our church that have maybe even been abused by bad spiritual leadership, have been taken advantage of by bad spiritual leadership. And how many, I mean, all of you know, we live in this world. How many times do you turn on the news and you get tired of seeing another pastor that falls into immorality? Or another f- pastor that was in it for the money and he took funds from his church and he was slipping them under the table and different things like that. Unfortunately, there is story after story after story of bad spiritual leadership. And you know what God's telling us this morning? He sees your hurt. He sees where you've been taken advantage of. There might even be a visitor here today that's just barely stepping their foot out. They're they're like, "Ah, I don't know if I want to try church out again because my last experience was bad. Can I tell you, it's not God that's bad. Leadership, men fail, but God never fails. And he sees and he knows your pain and he knows your hurt. And he's saying, you can trust me. I am good and I am loving and I am faithful and I will not tolerate it and I will judge it and take care of it one day. Can I tell you, from the depths of my heart and from the depths of my soul, listen, don't put your trust and faith in somebody like me. I'm just a man. I will fail you. Not that I want to fail you. Not that I'm trying to fail you. Every day of my life, I get up and I humble myself and I say, God, thank you for this This wonderful calling. I mean, I get to stand here and declare the truth of your word. God, help me to never do it in the wrong spirit. Help me to just be faithful to the truth of your word. Help me to live in front of my wife and my kids in a way that they would never say that there's hypocrisy there. or There's something that's off there. I need you to pray for me. I don't need you to trust me. I need you to trust in God. And I need you to trust in his word. And I need you to understand that he will never fail you. He will never forsake you. He will never let you down in any way possible, even if people in your life do. So trust the judge. And last but not least, take the stand. The whole idea again is, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. So we we make the promise. We understand the seriousness. We're not being frivolous about that promise at all. And then you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to take the stand, and he wants us to witness, and he wants us to testify to the world around us about who he is and what he says. God did not want his covenant to fail. Look at what he says in verses 4 and 5. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for fear, wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. I learned a lot this week about this covenant with Levi. You know, we talk about the covenant with Abraham and David and Isaac and Jacob. But you know that God made a covenant with Levi? And you know this covenant is awesome because it it started out really bad. Like Levi himself. Levi was one of Jacob's sons. And Levi and his brother Simeon, okay, something terrible happened to their sister. Something that was wrong. But what Levi and Simeon did was they decided to handle the matter themselves and they plotted revenge and they went in and they basically wiped out a whole community of men. And God said to them, because you were bloodthirsty and because you took life into your own hands and treated it frivolously, you're going to lose your inheritance. There's no land for you. Simeon gets swept into the tribe of Judah. But Levi, there's a trail of his history that goes through the Bible. So fast forward 400 years later, the children of Israel are in the wilderness. They're at Mount Sinai. Anybody know what happens at Mount Sinai? That's where they got the Ten Commandments, okay? God came down in thunderings and lightnings and a pillar of smoke, man. His presence is up there on the mountain. Moses goes up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And in less than 40 days, God's children are like, he's killed Moses. He's going to kill us. Let's do a really smart thing. You know, the God that parted the Red Sea and did all of those amazing plagues? Why don't we make a golden calf and why don't we worship an idol and get somebody to take us back to Egypt? How many of you agree that was a really bad life decision right there? So they they make a golden calf and they start worshiping him and Moses comes down off the mountain. They're in immorality, idolatry, slams the Ten Commandments on the ground. He's like, what are you doing? And you go through the story and there's a point where Moses says, Who is on the Lord's side? And you know who steps up? The sons of Levi. They step back on the scene and they're like, I'm done with this immorality. I'm done with this idolatry. I see who my God is. He parted the Red Sea. He led us out of Egypt. He's got a promised land that he's taken us to. I'm on the Lord's side. And they go and they execute God's judgment throughout the land of Israel. And you know what God says to Moses? He says, they, 
The sons of Levi are now the servants of the Lord. They're going to protect Aaron and his sons so they can do the priestly duties. And I'm giving you all the sons of Levi to take care of you. And you know what they were charged with? They were charged with, like, moving the tabernacle and carrying all the stuff. But you know what else they were charged with? They formed a wall of protection so that those people that convinced Aaron to sell out and build an idol, they couldn't get to the priest anymore. And they were supposed to, to vet off all of the threats that would come at, at taking people away from God. And God actually even gave them the sword and the power to execute judgment. If anybody comes in and tries to defile the faith, tries to defile this temple and this tabernacle, take care of them. That's that shell of protection, you understand? Well, guess what? A short while later, the sons of Levi fail. They're on the cusp of going into the promised land, and there is blatant immorality and idolatry sweeping through the land. I mean, there's a son of a prince of Israel, and he goes and gets a daughter of the prince of Moab, and they come into the camp, and they come inside that, that perimeter where the Levites are supposed to. They come all the way up to the, the tabernacle, to God's holy place, and they go inside the tent, and everybody knows what's happening inside that tent. There's immorality that's going on, and nobody's stepping up until finally there's a man by the name of Phineas. He's Aaron's grandson, and he says, enough is enough. I promise to value and to serve and to protect and defend the truth of God's word, and what's happening here is a shame. We are God's chosen people, and in his zeal for God, he takes a spear, and he goes into the tent, and he ends it. This is the Bible. Not stories that I'm making up. By the way, the Bible's got some really good stories inside of it, okay? He ends it. And you know what God does? He says, because of Phineas' zeal for me, I promise to make a perpetual covenant with the sons of Levi. And that was their job. I asked Pastor Joel to come in here this morning. Pastor Joel, everybody, he's got a baby with him. Don't ooh and ah that, Pastor Joel. But look at that baby. Everybody say, ooh. Everybody say, ah. Does anybody know what Pastor Joel's son is named? Phineas. How many of you have not heard that name Phineas being used very often in our world today, okay? <clears throat> very, it's an unusual name. I'm thankful for Pastor Joel. I'm actually thankful for Pastor Hamish, too. He just had a baby. He's got Hosea. We got Phineas. We got prophets. We got priests over here, okay? But the whole reason why Phineas is named Phineas is because of that story that I just told you. Pastor Joel appreciates that man's zeal that stepped up. And I know that they want to raise their son in that same type of lineage, in that same type of faith, so that when he grows up, he's zealous about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. And you know what's awesome, too, about Pastor Joel? He's our youth pastor. He takes it seriously. He's passionate about our, our kids, and our teenagers are being challenged on a regular basis to own their faith. To not sit on the sidelines and watch sin and corruption happen all around you, but not to be afraid to take a stand. Because when you stand for God, that's where life is at. That's where the blessings are. That's where the fulfillment is. And you know the best hope for Phineas over here? The best hope that he can step into that, that, that godly lineage and that heritage that's laid out here in the Bible is if you and I are sold out and serious about the faith that we have in Christ. And he grows up and he sees a passionate group of people that love and honor and fear God. And he sees a passionate group of people that are faithful to God's word, that get in it and read it every day, that, that understand that we are a kingdom of priests and we're messengers of the Lord. And we get to take the hope of the gospel and the good news of Jesus to a world. You know what will help Phineas more than ever? If there's a congregation, a church that's filled with people that walk in God's ways that love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that love others, that love our neighbor as ourself, that nobody would dare questioning, hey, they might not want our faith, they might reject Jesus, but they wouldn't dare question that what we have is something we believe in, something that's changed our life, something that we're passionate about. Will you give Pastor Joel a round of applause and Phineas as they walk away? The last point, I've already talked about it, but the last application that I want us to walk away with is just this, that we declare, so help me God. We take that stand. We get on that witness stand. We understand that, that it's all about the truth. It's about serving, protecting, valuing, loving, honoring the truth of God's word, pointing people to Jesus. 
And we take that stand every single day of our lives and we say, so help me God. So help me to be faithful to your word. So help me to walk in your ways. So help me to lift high the name of Jesus. So help me to fear you. So help me to be a testimony and a light for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help me not to become comfortable and help me not to become bored and help me not to treat this book frivolously, but help me to get up every day and understand who you are and what I have in you. So help me, God, help me to let that light of Jesus shine. And I'm telling you what, when we do that, God blesses it. You know, we had six people get saved and baptized today. In the first service, well, they got baptized today. They got saved in the past. But in the first service, we had three Marines. Two of them were led by the other one who just got tired of just saying, how long is it going to take before I step up and I honor God and I live my life for him? So he started a Bible study. And as a result of that, two of his friends now know Jesus as their Savior and are walking with him. I believe that Mackenzie's here today, and she got baptized because she had some friends, I mean, some people from our church that, that go to where she works and they told her about, am I getting this right? It's not you. That's somebody else. <laughs> She's looking at me like, this is a really good story, but it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> I don't know who it has to do with, but somebody. <laughs> no, I do know now. I remember there was some visitor, there's some people that have come the past couple of weeks. It was on the way out this morning and they were in the hallway. And that's what she told me. They've come two Sundays in a row. They came to our ladies coffee workshop that they just had this past Monday and they're loving our church. And it's because people from here have gone in to get their nails done and have talked about the Lord and have talked about our church. And all I'm trying to say is this, God wants to use you. He wants to use me. So let's take the stand and with every fiber of our being, so help me, God, live in a way that serves and protects and values and honors your truth and your name.